Hello again, Gunas. Yes, I extended that hello just to make sure you heard it, heard some of it, because normally when I do my hello, it ends up as low. And I'm not low at the moment, a bit jet lagged. Hitting the, uh, let's get a bit of advertising in, because can't seem to mon monetize. I was, was going to say something else, I'm not quite sure what, but certainly wasn't monetized. But yeah, look, you see, see that? It's my girlfriend, Starbucks girl, the mermaid. Well, I don't know why I'm going on about that, because I'm tired, yeah, and I've had a, two Starbucks and they're, they've sort of semi-kicked in and um, I'm there or thereabouts in terms of being awake, but um, but could be better. But it uh, doesn't get much better than being in Nagoya, does it? And getting to, to actually have a look at that picture. You see, um, when that came up on the screen, there was a, there was a black mark on the on the jumbotron right by Arsene Wenger's eye, and I thought I wasn't thinking about optician. I thought he might have to go to hospital or something because it looks quite serious. And um, yeah, I started talking very quietly when I said Arsene Wenger. And having sat in his press conference, it's the first time I've been in Arsene Wenger's press conference. I've been into Alex's, uh, not Mourinho. I've been in Rafa Benitez's press conferences. A number of top managers, never Arsene. But um, so that was my first time, and it was very difficult to hear him. I wish I'd have sat near the front instead of at the back, like a naughty school child that I am. Um, the difference is when when this guy speaks, Pixie, who could be an Arsenal manager, some people say. And having having met the guy, I'd love him to be an Arsenal manager. I've talked to him a couple of times. He's really down to earth and very charismatic. When he comes into the room, well, he's just he's kind of funny actually. He's a funny, you know, and he lives. He just calls it the way it is. He, he tells it like it is, and that's my opinion of him anyway. I think he's uh, no nonsense, but very talented guy. I mean, I know Nagoya, Grampus, um, are not doing as well as they once were. I don't know why the club Arsenal keep calling them Nagoya Grampus Eight, and they certainly keep calling Urawa Red. That instead of calling them Urawa Reds, they keep insisting on Red Diamonds. Well, Diamonds has gone from their their name. I wish somebody at the club would recognise that. But I saw I saw a lot of people from the club. I didn't talk to any of them, but uh, from Arsenal, and yeah, they they look like they're working pretty hard. Same couldn't be said for all the journalists there. They didn't even seem to watch the game, but I guess they'll catch up on the on the replays on Arsenal.com. So yeah, that's where all the top Arsenal news is, of course. But the only thing is, on the transfer front, there is no news. But uh, what news there is, I'm going to talk about, and then after that, I'm just going to probably talk about the match in general and might even give you the dubious uh, delight of having to listen to to all my notes from from the match well you're going to have to be a real fan to stick on you know to hang on there for that so sorry about all the rustling but i just wanted to show you what what you get apart from apart from a free one of these which you can't read it says arsenal asia tour 2013 there you go legend chapter two so um I don't know what chapter one was. I guess that was uh, Vietnam and Indonesia in a nutshell as a chapter all in itself. So look, just in case you don't know what a pitch looks like, you do now. I've got one of those um, and I couldn't understand any of it, of course. <laughs> said, said something about ENG, so I thought that's promising. That must be in English, but no. And there's, um, oh, I'm going to give you, um, yeah, the rundown on what was supposed to happen. But I'll tell you what, it didn't happen like that for me because I... I was running late because when I got in uh, Monday morning, see, I don't even know what day of the week it is. Now Tuesday morning here. On Monday morning when I got in, I was so, so tired because arriving at Osaka, then taking a Shinkansen with uh, with one of these passes, which I'm now going to show you. It's uh, Japan Rail Pass. And um, there you go. That's, I shouldn't show you all my details like passport number. There you go. <laughs> That's what one looks like. A Japan Rail Pass. So, um, anyway, um, what does it say? It's 28,000 yen. So, cheap at the price. What's that? About 180 quid, probably. And uh, you get that on the front. Look, Mount Fuji. That's about as close as I'm going to get to it. And then it's got all the details inside. But don't don't get it twisted, as as some people in, in the game like to say, the music game. Uh, don't get it twisted. It doesn't mean you can travel on any, on any railway. You cannot go on Nozomi. Um... Or Miz Mizuho, you cannot go on Mizuho. Mizu is water, I thought, but what do I know? So don't go on a watery train, and don't go on Nozomi. No Nozomi is it Nozomi or Nozomi? I don't know which, but don't go on either of those. And also, 
I had to pay on the subway. And the subway from where I'm at, which is quite near where Arsenal was staying, it cost a lot. And it won a fortune, but it was certainly about nearly a thousand yen, I'd say 800, 900. Um, Cause the way I do it, so I normally jump on the train, pay about 200 yen, and then I'll pay the rest when I get there because I can't be bothered queuing up and trying to work out you know, how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna do it. And um, yeah, it was pretty tricky actually, especially, I mean, I, I was tempted to film, film my way there, but I was running so late. I literally got, I got into the press area two minutes before kickoff. So that's not how I do things usually, but I was just so tired. I had to sleep at some point and having got to Nagoya in itself, that, that was difficult because, well, I took JR trains, the J Japan railway trains, and they were pretty good. So even though um, you can't um, you can't go on uh, Nismo or whatever or Mizu or whatever the watery train, and you can't go on the other that begins with N, something to do with a nosy train. So you can't get a nosy train, can't get a watery train. So what train can you get? Well, good news is you can get a train that is so good they've named a supermarket after it. Hickory is it? Hickory Dickory Dock. You can get on the Hickory Dickory Dock train and you can still arrive on time. Ha ha. Thank you. Right, it wasn't a great joke, was it? But anyway, I enjoyed it. So this was uh, the other stuff you got, uh, paperwork. Unlimited, unlimited paperwork. Yes, it certainly is. But I found this sort of moderately interesting because it, it sort of gave the rundown on what I kind of missed. Um, it tells you all the details, where you're at, Toyota Stadium, thanks for letting me know. Uh, Kickoff 1933, so even though I arrived, I know, I arrived 1928, Sounds like a time machine, but no, I was there uh, just before the um, what happened in 1930 Great Depression. So you're checking your historical knowledge. Anyway, 1933, that was the kickoff, and that was about right. So I waited about five minutes, had time to go to the toilet. Not what you want to know about about my uh, bodily functions, but you know, I'm not I'm not an alien, you know. Oh yes, I am. This is Japan. We're all aliens if you're not from this country here. Right, gates opened 3:30. Well, I certainly missed that. I was asleep then. Grampus OB Memorial Match kickoff. See, I, I could have seen the Grampus Old Boys, but I missed that. That was it. See, it's all very painstakingly laid out about the schedule, and, and that's one of the great things about Japan. So 4:45 that happened. Then there was player selection list com uh, submitted to the match commissioner. You can sort of imagine him with his huge epaulets because he's the match commissioner. He's like a referee, but yeah, you know, with with the with the kind of outfits that that say. Um, Say you know, like in Star Trek, you know, when Captain Kirk was uh, looking at court martialing Spock. Well, you know, let's not get into it, but you know, he wears all the medals and everything. Anyway, the end of the Grandpa's old old boy match would be at seventeen twenty-five. Then the arrival of the teams comes at six six p.m. Pitch inspection, uh, MC and the referees. What's the MC got to do with inspecting the pitch? Or am I missing something? Oh, it's a match commissioner. Sorry, I thought we meant the PA announcer, but no. Um, then. There's the match coordination meeting at 6.20, yes. Can you imagine what they're going to say there? They'll sit down and go, oh, so what are, what are we going to do? Well, each half has 45 minutes. Oh, yes, yes. I can imagine them all sitting there nodding. So that, was, that involved the MC, not the master of ceremonies, but instead, no, the match commissioner would be there with his epaulettes and medals, the referee, and the operation manager. So, yeah, in case there's, in case there's some sort of emergency, like, yeah. You know what I'm thinking about operation manager, but no, or it's not like that at all. But then there was the warm up for the goalkeepers. That that would be if, if one of them needs an operation, operation officer can get involved then. Warm up for goalkeepers, 6.45. Of course, Chesney wasn't involved in this game. He's, um, what's he got, a back injury? I wasn't aware of that when I arrived. And I, there I was thinking, I wonder if Arsenal got done some transfer business. Well, of course not, when I've caught up on the news afterwards. Because that's another thing that I have to say about Japan. Wi-Fi is is a rare beast here it's a, an extremely rare beast if you're lucky enough to spot a wi-fi zone that actually works do let me know about it they say starbucks works but i've just been to a starbucks and that one i can't get it to work anyway i've even signed up to the whole starbucks team i've even bought starbucks from uh, you can get starbucks all over the place even outside of starbucks that's good but the wi-fi isn't um and then when I tried to get Wi-Fi in my room, they just said, oh, look in, um, look in the manual. I said, look, it's not in the manual. And then they gave me this hugely long password. You can see it's like numerous digits. I don't want to give the 
game away, obviously they change these digits all the time, but how many digits in that password? There's got to be at least 12. Um, anyway, that's another story. So anyway, Chesney's injured, so I've got the chance to see Flapiansky, or Fabianski, should I say, because he's certainly a Fabian, he's fab more than flap lately, definitely. Definitely got more, more of the fab about him. Um, and I was pretty impressed with him, but I'll come to that later perhaps. Then, this is interesting, so the goalkeepers get their own little, own warm-up by themselves, but five minutes later, the outfield players come on. So that was at 6.50, I missed that. The warm-up session then ended at 19.10. Um, um, good year for wine, was it? No, it was a good year for World War shortly after, but that's... Yeah, see, I'm brushing up on your historical knowledge once again. Anyway, warm-up session ends, the teams return to the dressing room. And then... Please be punctual, it says, and it's in bold. So who, woe betide anybody that, that didn't take that piece of advice. And um, yeah, I nearly wasn't punctual. Part of the reason is in Japan, they've got these um, guys that wave around these kind of batons that uh, light up. And I've always called them lightsabers. They look very much something out of Star Wars. And they're waving these lightsabers around. And um, when you're trying to get from A to B very quickly as a pedestrian, they're not always awfully kind to you when you're trying to cross the road they just kind of almost hit you with a lightsaber so I, I had to I had to run and stop and run and stop just to make it on time um, and as I said it was a close run thing close run yes I was running so anyway um, where were we so please be punctual leave leaving from the dressing rooms so oh that's returning to the pitch I imagine so that's 1922, and I I don't know, what did they do that? I wasn't there. So 1924, check of equipment by referees. So I guess they're checking the nets and so on. Then 1926, children enter with fair play flag. So something else I missed. The minute A minute later, referees. It says both teams walk into pitch. I hope they didn't hurt themselves walking into the pitch, bump their noses and all that. Both managers going into the pitch. So... It's kind of different where we tend to go onto the pitch. Here they go into it and stand beside each side of referees. So you, as you can see, it's all painstakingly uh, arranged. Everyone, every moment you're on that pitch, um, it's all it's all organised. And that's one of the great things about Japan. Anyway, here we go. I like this one. Pennant exchange by managers after an announcement. <laughs> it's like uh, Arsene Wenger. I am going to exchange my pennant, my Jermaine pennant. He's going to go to your club and you're going to pay us to take him. Because he's a bit of a, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything bad about Jermaine Pennant because I had big hopes for him. Obviously, those hopes didn't come true at Arsenal. He was an excellent winger, I feel, and still has got something to offer the game. But unfortunately, um, it didn't work out, did it? Then we had the handshaking ceremony. We have a tea ceremony in Japan, but on these occasions, you have a handshaking ceremony. So it's all... Very ceremonial, I guess. Um, I wonder if they, they bowed, but I don't know because it wasn't there. Then there was the team photos. Oh, actually, that was about the time I was turning up, I think. Team photos. Up. It says here 1927, but it they gave it a six minute. They allocated six minutes to this. So the team photos, I saw that. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw the ceremonial handshakes. I probably saw some handshakes. And then the coin toss. Coin is in uh, capital letters, just to let you know. That's how important that coin was. I wonder if it was um, a yen, and how much, was it 100 yen? I don't know. Should I show you what 100 yen looks like? No, because I think I spent it all in Starbucks. Right, 1933, and then it, what did the announcer, PA announcer, I wish I could have recorded it, I kept missing it every time. I think he said, now, kick off! Like that, really loud. And uh, I, I just thought, I, I just like the way it's all hyped up here. Anyway, so um, first half, kick off! I think he might have even said first half as well. And he let us know that second half, kick off as well. And it was just so hyped. Anyway, half time, <laughs> underlined, underlined here. But there's a load of kanji or katagana or hiragana, one of their sort of hieroglyphics, if you like. Um, so I can't understand it at all. Romaji, I can sort of semi understand. That's like the way we write, basically. Anyway, it says half time underlined. Allowed to use the pitch. So I guess they're talking about substitutes, but that's not actually specified. Then, leaving from the dressing rooms. Please be punctual. Again, four minutes before second half. Kick off! 
And then we've got the announcer saying, second half, kick off! Now, I think he said first. So then it says 15 minutes after the end of first half. Well, most players should know that by now. Then, after the match, flash interview with managers and players. Then, photo session, Grampus and Arsenal. Press conference, Arsenal, Grampus. Well, I saw, as I said, Pixie, the Grampus manager, and uh, Arsene Wenger. And then it specifies all the colours. Tells you who's a match commissioner and the referee, assistant ref one, assistant ref two, fourth official. All very, very organised. Even got even got the ball boy's name here. He was a uh, Nagoya Grampus under 18 year old. I didn't. There's only got one of them. Maybe he was chief ball boy, and he deserved a, a mention. Look, you've got a mention right down there, down the bottom. See, well, I know you can't see it, but just just to show you. So I just want to just want to run through all the bits and pieces. It's like going on Blue Peter or something. Look, if it gets hot. You have one of these, a fan, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I saw more men u using these fans than women, which I'm not going to even say what, uh, what, most, what, what most Brits would think about that. I suppose we tend to think of these as a little bit effeminate, to be honest, but I don't know, is it, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be like so chauvinistic really, should we? What do you think? I mean, there's a beer sponsor on that, it's not my favourite for Sahi, but apparently that's a very very much a Western thing, because I was talking to um, to a guy on the plane, and it turns out, so a little bit of transfer news coming coming your way all of a sudden, sorry it's all over the place today, but a bit like me, um, yeah I was talking to a guy on the plane, and he knows Cerezo Osaka's number eight, and if you check him up on Wikipedia, his name, uh, the football player is Kakitani, uh, Yoichiro Kakitani, he's 23 years old, and he actually did train with Arsenal, that's very fine on Wikipedia, not that you can believe everything you see on Wikipedia, but anyway, he, he knew the ins and outs of this guy, apparently they're friends, and he said that uh, Kakitani is, is going to be moving to the Bundesliga probably in January. I said which club, he said he didn't know, but I don't think it's been finalised just yet. So it makes you wonder, why are we not considering bringing Kakitani in? Perhaps we don't need another attacking midfielder, he's got 10 goals in 17 games in this J, J1 league season so sounds to me like uh, it's worth bringing him in if we had him on trial so to speak that's what this guy told me when I checked Wikipedia they said he just trained with us but he certainly why was he training with us if he, if he wasn't on trial so my view is let's have another look at him perhaps or well, while Arsene's here well he won't see any games because the J, J league season is um, well it's, it's not exactly suspended but it's the halfway stage and uh, obviously San Freche Hiroshima top of, top of the league. Cerezo pushing up there again now and uh, Kakitani's goals would have helped him do that. So he also trained with Inter Milan but it looks like he's going to the Bundesliga unless some uh, Premier League club do make a move for him. Uh, this friend of Kakitani said that um, as far as he's concerned um, Kakitani and a lot of Japanese players do prefer to play in the Bundesliga purely because uh, they think it's more technical there. Whereas in the UK, uh, physicality is really important. And talking of physicality, of course, um, you should eat these if you want to get big and big and strong. What are they like? Beef? Well, these 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 people were like advertising clearly. I'm, I think I'm going to bin that. Sorry about whoever style one. Well, um, is he getting beefed up now, uh, Rio? Uh, you know, Miechi is he beefed up since uh, since arriving? Well, he, he's certainly not uh, not one of the Nagoya Grampus players for six. I do believe it was Tulio who needed some medical treatment after a collision with Rio, uh, and I think that was um, that's a good sign anyway. Especially as Rio was certainly unfit; it was quite clear he looked very leggy. Um, and um, anyway, then there's the other thing I've got given: rules of access for the members of the media. So you get these kind of things in the UK, but just not to the same level. Well, you know, they're so exact. So I've got a map of, oh, and I, well, I don't know. I didn't use a map. I kind of instinctively worked out where it should be. But, um, but yeah, here it's just got all the details about where you can and can't stand. And I mean, I just looked at the journalist's bit, so I'm not, wasn't really allowed pitch side, although I have been pitch side at Nagoya before, but that's another story. It says journalists, one, accessible areas, Four areas, press seat area, media center, interview room, mixed zone. Um, so that's where the photographers mingle with you. And then there's, oh, it's getting a bit boring, so I think I'll skip that. But anyway, it says do not eat and drink. I think I've, I've uh, I certainly don't remember eating in it, but I certainly, 
uh, drank in the in the Nagoya area. Or what's that? That's something I did eat at some point. Yeah, I struggled getting food actually. And um, yeah, so one more thing to show you that wasn't given to me by the club, but um, but actually getting to the match on time was such so traumatic for me. Oh yes. But look, look at look at the map I had to go on. This tiny map. I didn't have a clue where where I had to get off. But this is this is a kind of underground map, if you like. And uh, I started off. Well, there's Nagoya um, Station, uh, JR Station. So I got off there. Then then it was time to start paying money for trains. Um, staying in a place called Sak Sakai Sakai um, there. And then I had to. First, I had to get some line, some I think it's a yellow line, which means what? What does that mean? It means it's the Higashiyama, Higashiyama line. Does that mean Eastern Mountain or something? I'm not sure. Yama probably means mountain. Higashi certainly means east. So anyway, probably goes west from west to east. Uh, that line. So I went west to a place called Fushimi, where I changed, and then. Then it was the blue, like I'd call it like our Piccadilly line, because it's blue, right? So it's called the Su Suramai line, and I had to get that and be on that train for at least almost an hour, actually. So I went right from Fushimi, and it went all the way past here. So I didn't even know which stop I had to get off at. There was like there was one stop called. Kami Toyota, and I thought it's surely got to be that. Sounds like uh, Kami, you know that guy that presents on Sky Sports sometimes. Kami, Kami is even in adverts. Toyota, Toyota Stadium, right? It's got to be there. Anyway, luckily I saw some uh, only a couple of uh, Nagoya fans, so I just waited for them to get off the train, and, and then I got off the train at the same same place. Then I saw them jump on the end of another queue, and I thought, oh, what's this? I've, I've only got 20 minutes to get to the game. I've heard it's a 15-minute walk. Well, it was at least a 15-minute walk with what all, with all these Star Wars people in the way and and the crowds moving very slowly. It was it felt like 25 minutes walk in those conditions. It was boiling hot as well. I was running, perspiring like the proverbial and uh, proverbial pig. I don't normally say oink oink, but I will today. So I got all that way and it was about 20 odd stops. Uh, luckily I made it. I'm so glad I didn't jump on the bus because I think I might have been late otherwise because the bus, I don't know how often they were turning up but there were too many people to get on the bus anyway. So so yeah, anyway, I've, I've now shown you my map. I think I've, I've done all, all the paperwork because, you know, I'm, you know, as that song says, turning Japanese, I really think so. But, um, but yeah, so I was going to talk about the transfer news, wasn't I? But should I talk about the match first? Mm, perhaps I will and then I'll keep you hanging on for the transfer news. Um, because I'm sort of in match mode now, so so yeah, okay. There was a lot of um, a lot of queuing um, that that happened all day long, pretty much from my first arrival in uh, Kansai Airport, which is Kicks, known as Kicks. That sounds very football, but it isn't a KIX. So then I had to queue to get a Japan Rail Pass to then use the train. Yeah, obviously it saves you money though, because uh, trains are pretty cheap here in comparison, um, and then. The uh, Shinkansen, the Shinkansen that you can actually get, the Hikari Shinkansen, it's not really that um, that slow, it doesn't stop, uh, uh, sorry, it does stop more than Nozomi, so that's, uh, that's you lose a few minutes, that's all, and I mean, to get from, uh, to get from where Kansai, well, one, the thing is, once I got from the airport into Osaka, that took quite a long time, that must have been an hour, close to an hour, um, and that, that involved quite a few uh, train changes as well. Then Shin Osaka, you go from Shin Osaka. Why is it called Shin? I can't remember. But there's all these Shin, Shin everything, like Shin Pokemon. I remember watching on South Park once. But anyway, Shin Osaka. Uh, then you go, then it stops off at Kyoto, uh, and then then you go to Gifu. There's a couple of other stops in between. One called My Bra sounded like My Baru. Um, I certainly could have done with. Um, I I got chipples. Or something like what my dad used to call chipples, these kind of chips. Because um, cause you get these kind of, um, a dolly trolley walks around and says um, in Japanese, you know, would you like to buy all these um, products? And there's quite a few to choose from. But then when you try and give them the rubbish, they just don't want to know. So you've got to sort out your own rubbish. So I'll try to put it back on the trolley, which 
I didn't get I didn't get in trouble for it, but I did get in trouble for not sitting in the right seat. And I'll tell you what, I'm just on that note, I just don't understand their whole train reservation system here at all. Because it says here something about reserve. It says this pass is valid, this Japan Rail Pass. This pass is valid for reserved and non-reserved ordinary car railway travel on all JR Group Limited Express trains, including Shinkansen bullet trains, but not Nozomi or Mizuho. Um, and so it's valid on these limited express, uh, express trains and rapid or local trains. So you've got a variety of trains to go on, but they're all JR, so don't start going on some private private one. It says the pass is also valid for JR Miyajima on the Miyajima ferry between Miyajima and Miyajima Gucci. Oh, that's interesting. I might even take a boat trip if I could find where Miyajima is. I have no idea. You can also use, I didn't know this, see I'm finding out stuff as I go, local buses operated by the JR Hokkaido bus, JR bus Tohoku. Um, Hokkaido obviously is right in the north of Japan, don't expect I'll get there. Uh, and then the JR bus Kanto, that's sort of Tokyo area, JR Tokai bus and the West Japan JR bus, the Chugoku JR bus, the JR Shikoku bus and the JR Kyushu bus and the Tokyo monorail. So, um, but anyway, it's not valid on ones that travel on highways. So there's just a lot of things to take in, but it said something about, oh, here we go, the seat reservations. Seat reservations can be made at no additional charge. So basically you reserve a seat without paying anything Providing that when the services are crowded, this pass cannot guarantee the availability of reserved seating on a specific train. So I've got a reservation, I can't sit in my seat because it's busy. So what do they class as busy? But I had to move out of the way for somebody that just came in. I remember when the when foot, uh, shoe was on the other foot, not the foot was on the other shoe, but the shoe was on the other foot. And I had a reservation and some guy was asleep in my seat, so I let, I let it go. You know, I didn't really want to shake him and go, Sumasek, Sumasek. I didn't want to do that, but if, if I was asleep, I'm going to get Simus End. No question about that. So, um, anyway, to make a reservation, you must go to a reservation office, which is called a Midori no Maduguchi, or any travel service center at a JR station, or to the sales office or or uh, sales office of travel agency before boarding the service you wish. So, maybe in theory, I could do that on the on the way back to Kansai, because I'm going to Kansai, then, then Saitama. So, um, yeah, what else? There, show the pass to obtain um, your reserved seat ticket. You can travel using non-reserved tickets with this pass alone. Please note, however, some trains do not have non-reserved seats, so I could be in trouble if I do that, right? If you wish to travel in a private compartment, I'm not going to do that, because I'm sure that involves money. Um, yeah, there is an additional charge, and, and a green car charge if the private car compartment is a green car. What's that mean? green car that means you can't have any electric electronic equipment in it or something and then any extra charges to the basic fare are additional if you want to be in a sleeping car in green car again in grand class grand class is like i'm the grandfather i'm going grand class there's no d on the end of it uh, and any extra charge is also necessary to travel on a local or rapid service requiring a number ticket or liner ticket once on board train or ferry Pass is not negotiable, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I think you've had enough of the train pass. Let's get back to the real stuff, Arsenal. So I think I'll sandwich in the transfer news because I've mean, been really patient. I've been talking a lot and really um, full of it, aren't I? Um, so what, what's this? This is uh, the transfer news, the latest transfer news, okay? Um, I read this on a site called anorak.co.uk. I don't normally visit that site, but um, it was quite interesting because uh, they'd compiled a list on the site of, of all the deals all the uh, Higuain deals. Yeah, I said it right. But guess what? I was thinking, what would we call Higuain if he did arrive, did arrive at Arsenal? Would we call him, nickname him Higgy, perhaps? Like uh, Hignet. Remember remember Hignet? Used to play for Middlesbrough? Perhaps not. Anyway, we'd call him Higgy, and then we've got a Higgy and an Iggy. But if you're going to drop the H, then it would be really confusing, because we've got Ignazi Mikel, uh, also known as Iggy, and then we'd have Iguain, also known as Iggy. So two Iggy's. So twenty-three million pounds for Iggy. He was going to sign. It was a definite. So said the Sun. John Cross also said the same thing. I think he said it would happen the eleventh of July. Well, John, that's been and gone. John's in Nagoya, by the way, and the Daily Mirror are making a big thing of that. And from Nagoya, John Cross said that um, forty million pounds a make-or-break deal for Suarez. 
How does he know? I mean, he must have been on the phone or Skype or something back to the UK to find out what's going on with the Luis Suarez situation. But he did say Iguain would join us. It's not happened. But I think at least to, to give him credit, he's, he's a proper Arsenal fan, you can tell. And, and I do appreciate that, you know, the fact that, you know, we've got people on our side. We need that in the media because clearly not enough of those. Uh, so, yeah, John John's here in uh, Nagoya. I've not met him yet. I'd love to. Um, he's been involved in the um, on the Guna podcast as well, so you might want to check some of those. But uh, but yeah, from here he reckons the Luis Suarez deal is make or break, forty million pounds. But um, obviously that's another signing. But back to Iguain, Anorak.co.uk said have, have noted all the deals. Metro said thirty million pound deal done and dusted. Eurosport said thirty two. This was about a week ago or something. Daily Mirror then said, um, I think it was John Cross as well said the deal stalled because. This twenty-four million uh, pound deal that was all agreed. It looked like Iguain's advisor and his father, I think, had agreed the deal, but suddenly Real Madrid hiked up the price to 30, 32 million, so it didn't go through. So then the Daily Express um, came up with their idea of what was going to happen. Napoli came in under Rafa Benitez, of course. They're, they're now uh, competing with us, I think, for a few transfer targets. Napoli weren't going to pay um, that kind of money, but. Nonetheless, uh, a Spanish newspaper or media outlet called ABC say a deal has been done for 35 million euros. So if that is in fact true, Iguain, Iguain is not going to be joining us. He's joining Napoli for 35 million euros. Meanwhile, of course, I flagged up the idea that Chelsea might come in for him because they've missed out on a few striking transfer targets. So Iguain would be of interest to them. Um, so the price now, apparently, Real Madrid will settle for 34.5 million pounds, which is considerably more than 35 million euros I do believe I haven't checked the exchange rate but I think it's a little quite a bit more anyway so make of it what you will I don't think it's going to happen and clearly Arsene Wenger doesn't think the Bernard deal the Brazilian the kind of diminutive Brazilian who reminds me in a way of Andre Arshavin he except this guy can actually play play wide and looks quite comfortable there um, having seen him in Confederations Cup action on TV Thought he was, he would be a good addition, but I just don't see um, that we would play him. Although we could have done with him in the second half against Nagoya, because it was going to come to that in the game. We certainly lacked balance in the second half. Um, but anyway, back to Bernard for a moment. A deal was very close, according to L'Equipe of France, and L'Equipe should know, shouldn't they? They know everything about Arsene, but perhaps uh, uh, this t on this occasion they've reported it incorrectly because Arsene Wenger, when I was in the press conference, what did he say? He said this is rubbish or something like that. He just said it was a wrong report, not true. That's from the horse's mouth. I managed to actually hear him say that. It was a very short reply to it, uh, to the question. Anyway, apparently Bernard will sign for us if his current team, Atletico Mineiro, get knocked out of the um, what cup are they in? That uh, Copa Libertadores. If they get knocked out of that by Olympia Asuncion Wednesday night. A £21 million deal could be done and he will earn in the region of £2.6 million a year. So, there you have it. That's what may happen on the transfer front. I thought I had some additional notes on it, but perhaps not. Um, um, yeah, that's a bit... Well, Sesc is non-transferable. Um, I think I've covered that in a previous um, vlog. The Metro say Cesar, Julio Cesar, will have to take a pay cut to join us, but I thought it was on the way to Napoli. Um... And, um, well, aside from that, let's get on to the game then. Well, we lined up We lined up Fabianski in goal. He played the entire game. A defence, I thought, even though we did concede a goal against Nagoya, I thought our defence looked pretty good. Uh, CJ uh, Jenkinson, right back. Um, pretty solid game. Didn't make many, many mistakes. I'd say one mistake at most. I thought Bakari Sanya at centre-back was excellent. I was reading on somebody, somebody else's uh, blog that they didn't really rate uh, Sanya in that position. Uh, I disagree. I thought the pairing of Sanya and Mertesacker works incredibly well. Sanya reads the game well. I think I think he's arguably a better centre back than he is a right back at the moment. Uh, I think I think we could get a lot of mileage out of playing Sanya there. But if we do that, let's come come on Arsenal. Let's get him signed up to a longer term deal. Um, I, I really think it will give him a new lease of life playing there. So I. Would, consider sticking with Sanya at centre-back. And I think Arsene is seriously considering doing that, obviously, because Shelney is out with... Uh, what, what did he do? Uh, twisted his ankle, I think. 
So he's out with an ankle injury. Um, there's obviously a lot of problems in defence injury-wise. There was uh, a back injury sustained by um, by Nacho Monreal means that he's going to be out of action for, until mid-October, according to one website. So that that needs um, looking at because Kieran Gibbs is certainly in form at the moment. Rampaging runs from Kieran Gibbs. Really impressed with him. Um, he looks he looks to me the best uh, English left back. But maybe that's going some. Obviously, a lot of people still rate Ashley Cole, but um, I've never been. Uh, I don't. I know he's joined Chelsea for the money, and we call him Cashley. Well, some people did, and I did. Even even me, I did call him that occasionally. I didn't shout it at him, but yeah, I wasn't always a bit annoyed about him leaving. But I could understand it because the club didn't sort out the financial arrangements early enough. I really think Ashley Cole would have stayed had we really, um, yeah, just just made those negotiations work. Instead, we lost England's left back to one of our rivals because we couldn't sort out the financial side of it. I think Gibbs is going to be a lot easier to work with. I know somebody who knows Gibbs and he's a really, um, he's a very, very dedicated player. A bit like Rio Miyaichi, of course. And, uh, and the guy, I was calling him Kakigori, because Kakigori is like an ice cream -y kind of product. It's like mainly ice that they sell. I recommend you try it. It's like you get a bit of cream or strawberry or something, and it's like strawberry ice. It's, just, it's great on these hot days in Japan. But anyway, uh, Kakitani, I always forget his name. But Kakitani, as I said before, could be a player we might want to consider looking at. I don't expect it's going to happen. It's going to be another sort of Yaya Toure situation where we've taken a look at a player, decided we didn't like him, but he's turned over a new leaf. And now he is very much the um, ideal professional footballer in as much as he doesn't go out and party anymore. Back in the day, he, he was at, he was well, he was staying out late, you know, not living the sort of professional footballer's lifestyle that they should lead. Uh, Rio Miechi, of course, you can tell straight away that he is... He is putting, well, he's committed. His, his attitude is right. And as Arsene Wenger said, that's why he's keeping him at the club for, for a while longer, at least. Uh, I suspect he may well, um, unless he really impresses during this pre-season, I, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Mia Ichi does, Mia Ichi does in fact go on loan somewhere. Because uh, having seen him, having seen him in action, uh, I'd have to say, um, I've seen him on TV, obviously, but to see him for the first time, um, you know, actually at a game, it was quite exciting for me because, as you may well know, I've written a book on on the Aichi, and so I've been following his career really closely. No, in fact, I did see him at Millwall. I saw him score his first goal in English football, amazing goal, and he nearly scored um, from open play, of course, against Nagoya. And he snatched at a shot, but it was it was well well struck, left foot volley, just missed uh, just missed the goal. Um, by a fraction and then of course he scored from the spot um, scoring with his right foot so he does seem very two-footed and it's taken me quite a while to work out which is his uh, best foot but clearly it's his right foot that's what he's using for dead balls but he doesn't get the chance to take many dead balls at Arsenal I was thinking he needs to be a bit more assertive because Kieran Gibbs at one point uh, he was rampaging forward which meant Rio had to defend a lot and I, I don't think he's really cut out for defending particularly although he's clearly working on it um, another area he needs to work on is, is heading, his six foot should be uh, making more of a nuisance of himself. He does jump for the ball, but he never gets his head to it. Uh, I must admit, I've never been the best at heading myself, but, uh, but I'm not playing professional football. I did work on it a bit. I was forced to. And Rio needs to work on that too, because sometimes when the ball's coming into the box and he's out wide on the wing, he should be moving into the box to get his head on it. But as I said, positionally, in that respect, he wasn't doing too badly, but he was, I think it was down to his tiredness and lack of match fitness, but at times near the end of that first half, he was getting in players' way. I think uh, Theo Walcott made a run, and Rio kind of cut across him, and he wasn't available for the pass. Um, we ended up getting a penalty from it, because Olivier Giroud got the ball, and then, and then the uh, defender slid in and got his touched the ball with his hand so so Rio in fact got to score a goal as a result of that and he took it very well just slammed it low to the keeper's right um, I thought excellent job on that uh, very cool under a certain amount of pressure even though it's a friendly game uh, every touch that Rio made was under scrutiny and you know having said that because I was in fact writing down notes on pretty much every touch of the ball and there weren't 
there weren't really enough of them, uh, I didn't feel. Um, he, most of his passes were short passes. Um, and not all of them, I mean, I think it was the nerves affecting him, but not all of them went to Arsenal players, unfortunately. Um, mostly, yeah, he's just he's a proper team player. You can't question his, as, as Wenger said, you can't question his attitude and commitment. But there were a couple of balls that weren't exactly to his feet. He had to run for and he couldn't quite make it. And I wondered, has his pace been affected? I'm a little bit worried about that, I have to say, because I think if you take his pace away, even though he's got a lot of skill, um, he only actually turned his play out once that I recall and but he was up against a formidable opponent I felt um, Tanaka um, I forgot his first name H Tanaka I can't remember what the H stands for but this this guy's 31 I think and he was up and down the pitch uh, like you wouldn't believe really he, I mean how he, where he's getting this energy from I really don't know so he was defending he was he was very difficult to play against. At one one stage, Theo and uh, Rio switch wings, and um, and yeah, it, I don't remember Theo getting past him very much either. So he was up against a tough opponent. So don't don't underestimate Nagoya. They might not be doing that well in in J1, but they're a pretty good side. I w it'd be interesting to see how they'd fare in the Premier League if that's never going to happen. But yeah, anyway, so looking through the team, yeah, I was impressed. The back four I thought was solid. Obviously, first half we were winning 2 0 thanks to uh, Olivier Giroud's goal, which came from a Rizicki cross. And I have to say, you know, I've been very critical of Rizicki, but I thought um, yesterday he was he was um, exemplary. Um, he's running, he's, he didn't stop. And I'll tell you one thing I really liked about um, our midfields in the first half. So we had Theo kind of on the right, Rio on the left. Rio was a bit more defensive minded than Theo. But um, but this midfield worked really well. Uh, Rosicki, Arteta, and Ramsey, they seem to all be on the same wavelength. They formed this triangle in, you know, just showing you a triangle shape, just in case you forgot what they look like. But, um, but this triangle changed, you know. The guy at the pinnacle of the triangle changed. So sometimes it was Rosicki, uh, sometimes it was Ramsey. Uh, I don't remember seeing Arteta at the pinnacle, but those other, the other two, they changed it. And, and one dropped back as deep as Arteta and, and they seemed quite disciplined and I was impressed with that and um, yeah, Giroud took his goal very well a header from um, Rosicki's cross so couldn't moan about that second half though obviously it were it was a bit different um, Fabianski continuing goal in goal and, and the back four remained the same until the 15th minute when Iggy Mikel came on um, I was reading somewhere that people don't necessarily trust Iggy <laughs> trust him they don't trust him no it's not like you've got to lock up your valuables when he comes near I just don't think he's um, he's really done enough and yeah I think he can be suspect but he's playing at left back he's a centre back but anyway he's playing at left back so um, he did okay but having said that the goal came from that wing as I mentioned before um, the uh, 31 year old uh, Tanaka got a cross in it was a really good cross and uh, Yano uh, Kisho Yano scored a goal for and Nagoya were threatening to score a goal in the first half though uh, a combination of good defending and poor finishing from them led to us keeping a clean sheet in the first half um, second half though what I didn't like about our side um, in a nutshell I don't like to pick on players really um, especially experienced Germany internationals like Podolski who I like very much but I didn't think he really put a lot of effort in and I'm not just going to blame him though it just felt to me like the midfield was completely unbalanced who was playing on the right wing uh, there was without Theo we really looked weak on that on that flank and I, obviously Theo's not a right winger but he just seems to just get on with things and but I'm still saying you know like his finishing has been criticized Theo, and I think part of it is because he's playing on the right wing if you keep playing him on the right wing his finishing isn't going to improve as much as it would if he, if he were a striker Having said that, he had a lot of opportunities to score a goal and didn't manage to do so uh, until sec the second half, of course. So when Theo went off the pitch uh, some way through the second half, anyway, I thought I thought that's when we kind of crumbled. Um, obviously, um, we did concede a goal after after Theo went off, and not only that, um, he scored a, he scored a nice goal, dinking it over the goalkeeper. And as I said, he had a, plenty of other opportunities, one on one with the keeper, and messed them up. But Let's give the goalkeeper a bit of credit. The first half goalkeeper who, who played most of the second half, uh, forgot his name, Narizaki, was it or something? Uh, anyway, 
he was he was pretty good. He he made a lot of good saves, but most mostly from Theo. So poor Theo could have had a hat trick easily, but didn't. And so he's going to get some flack for not scoring goals. But as I keep saying, if we don't play him as a striker, we're not really going to see the best of him. Although he does a reasonable job on the right wing and he's getting to take a lot of dead balls. Maybe that's the deal. Maybe Arsene said to him, look Theo, if you continue to play on the right wing for me, I'll let you take all the all the corners. Because I remember Rio winning a corner at one point and then had to give the ball up to let uh, Theo deliver it. And his deliveries are getting better and better through the practice. And as I said, if he played through the middle, he would get better and better as a striker through practice. The only way you improve as a striker is actually play there. So I won't labour the point. I'll stop there. But um, but yeah, talking of the midfield, Jack Wilshere obviously did a really good job coming on as a sub. Uh, Zelalem, he... Um, I don't think he played that well, to be honest. He's played very well against Indonesia, the Indonesian Dream Team, and also against uh, against Vietnam, did excellently well. But not so well um, against Nagoya Rampus. Um, Chucks Aniki, he got to play in a, in a more familiar position. Obviously, we've tried him at centre-back. I don't think that particularly worked. Um, he wasn't terrible, he did okay, but no, he's not... I don't see him breaking in the team, judging on these three performances so far in the preseason. And on this game, well, he just didn't get involved enough. He didn't. Again, he didn't do anything particularly wrong, but he, he just didn't make an impact. Uh, Serge Gnabry. Now, the fans were even singing "na na 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 na," whatever the song is. You know, the Casey and the Sunshine Band song we used to sing for Nazri, and they sounded like they're singing Serge Gnabry. But I wasn't sitting with the fans despite having a ticket because they've got in the press area. Anyway, he came on, and I think he made an impact. And I've been quite critical of the, the previous games, but I think he stepped up to the plate and decided, after seeing Rio's first half performance, which was a bit hit and miss, mostly miss, unfortunately. I, I hate to say it, because I love Rio to bits. The more I hear him talk, the more I see his attitude, the more I like him as a player. But he's just, because of the injuries, I feel. Um, he might, he might, I'm not going to rule Rio out, obviously, I'm not going to do that. But Serge Nabry. He looked hungry. He looked hungry. He looked like he really wanted to play uh, to step up to the first to first team duty. And, and judging by his performance, um, in what was a disjointed second half performance, there were there were there was a moment where he cut inside two players and and curled a shot just wide of the far post. And I thought that was a magic moment. That's one of those moments that a manager a manager looks on and, and takes notice and thinks, right, you might even be in my squad. And the, and the way we're going in terms of not bringing players in. We need every everybody we can get. So Nabry wouldn't surprise me if he's in the, on the on the bench for our first game of the season. And then Agpom, who's been getting the plaudits, one of them being me. Um, on this performance, no plaudits for Agpom. He didn't do enough. He was through on goal one on one occasion, but was offside. Um, I think it was Anike's through ball. Clearly, these two guys are on a similar wavelength. That's what I felt. Um, looking after each other, they've got each other's backs. That's what it feels like. Both got names beginning with A, um, and and, uh, and and first names beginning with C, so CAs. Um, in the sort of world of um, in the world of uh, the teacher, that means controlled assessment, but or it can mean California, right? In America, CA. Anyway, these two CAs, the two CAs. I, I just didn't think I did enough against Nagoya Grampus and Zelalem also just didn't do what what we've seen. I mean Zelalem in the in the other two games on TV because obviously I watched I didn't watch him live. Um, just watched him. Uh, what did I call it? As live, <laughs> as live, as land. Sounds like uh, something out of Narnia. But anyway, I watched it as live, and um, yeah, the, the Zelalem was so impressive. Anyway, on this performance, not so impressive. So based on that. I'd have to say no, um, the only one out of those youngsters who's going to make a breakthrough this season, I wish I could be saying it's Rio Miyaichi, um, but right now I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's Nabri. I'm starting to agree with everyone else, and I'm saying perhaps it's not going to be Akpom. I thought Akpom was going to be the guy, because not just because he scored goals, but I loved the way, loved the way he sort of um, was a handful. He was a handful all the time, but against uh, again, maybe because these these guys are experienced, the the defenders. Uh, the Nagoya Grampus defence are experienced players. Um, they've played, you know, lots of competitions, and and you know they're kind of in full swing as well. We have to remember because their season's halfway through; they've stopped for midsummer break, so they're really 
they're really at the top of their game, if you like. And um, anyway, Ekpom just made no impact at all against them, unfortunately. But uh, still got high hopes for him. He's, he's still a youngster. Uh, we didn't see the other the other players didn't didn't make an appearance. Uh, so that makes me feel that they're not going to be making the breakthrough. But Nabry, yeah, that's that's definitely a game for him to remember. Even though he he didn't uh, score, uh, he did well enough. So I think that's um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I should say sayonara this time, shouldn't I? But instead I'll go away until the next time. Up the gunner.